Welcome to a live BYU devotional broadcast. Today, Elder Peter M. Johnson, a General Authority 70 of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will address the campus community. The devotional originates from the Marriott Center on the BYU campus. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our devotional. We're pleased to have Elder Peter M. Johnson, a General Authority 70, as our speaker, speaker today. We extend a special welcome to his wife, Stephanie, who is seated next to him, and other family members and friends who are here. There will not be a devotional next week due to Friday class schedule and the Thanksgiving holiday, but we invite you to join us two weeks from today for a campus forum when we will have the opportunity to hear, to hear from Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, a climate scientist. We hope you will plan to attend. This morning's prelude was provided by David Keim, a senior piano and organ performance major from Provo, Utah. Sheridan Jones, a senior studying choral music education from Irvine, California, led us in the opening hymn. The invocation this morning will be offered by Micah Johnson, a freshman from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and a son of Elder and Sister Johnson. Immediately following the opening prayer, the BYU University Chorale will sing Be Still My Soul. They will be conducted by Jennifer Grover, a graduate student in choral conducting from Phoenix, Arizona. They will be accompanied on the oboe by Kayla Farnsworth, a senior majoring in instrumental music education from Farmington, New Mexico, and David Keim on the piano. Now the prayer by Brother Johnson. Dear Father in heaven, we're very grateful to be gathered here together today as students and faculty and, and visitors of Brigham Young University. Father, we're grateful for the, the blessing and privilege it is to be members of and associated with this, this great university. We're thankful for the, the wonderful people in our lives who have made it possible to be here at this moment. Father, please bless us with the, thy spirit as we listen to the words shared by Elder Johnson, that we can be uplifted and, and motivated and inspired to, to do better and to, to continue to strive to learn more about our Savior, Jesus Christ, and apply his teachings in our life. We're thankful for our Savior, Father, and we're thankful for the atonement Please continue to help us to apply the atonement in our lives as we strive to, to be better and do better each and every day. We love you so very much, and we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, University Chorale, Sisters Grover and Farnsworth and Brother Kime, for that stirring music which has set the tone for the remainder of our meeting today. We're privileged to have Elder Peter M. Johnson as our devotional speaker this morning. 
Elder Johnson was sustained as a General Authority 70 of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in April 2019. He received a PhD in accounting from Arizona State University and has taught at BYU-Hawaii, BYU, and the University of Alabama. He and his wife, Stephanie, are the parents of four children, and they have one grandson. Following Elder Johnson's remarks, the benediction will be offered by Whitney Johnson Catt, Associate Athletic Director for Student Athletes Development, Diversity and Inclusion, and a daughter of Elder and Sister Johnson. Now we'll be pleased to hear from Elder Peter M. Johnson. Thank you for that wonderful choir number, beautiful. Sisters and brothers, thank you. Thank you for your faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your courage to stand as a witness to his name. And thank you for all that you do to become and help others to become true followers of Jesus Christ and enjoy the blessing of the Holy Temple. You are beautiful, you are loved. Almost every time I'm on a university campus, I remember my early days as a college student. I graduated high school in Hawaii, and during my senior year, most of my friends were planning to attend college. This was a new idea for me, as none of my family had ever attended college. I visited with my high school counselor to express my desire to pursue university studies. She was surprised and chuckled just a little, or maybe a lot. She kindly suggested other options besides university studies. I left her office disappointed, but not discouraged. I then visited my high school basketball coach and asked him what options I had to attend college. He was honest and mentioned one way that I may be able to attend college was on an athletic scholarship. And so I started to gather news articles about my success as a high school athlete and wrote letters to several colleges. This was before Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and email. I received many rejection letters, and many colleges did not respond. Fortunately, I did receive a partial scholarship to play basketball for Brigham Young University, Hawaii. A few weeks before school began, I met with my academic advisor to sign up for classes. She mentioned that because BYU-Hawaii was a religious institution, I needed to take religious courses as part of my academic studies. At this time, I was a Muslim as a member and a faithful member of the Nation of Islam. I expressed a desire to better understand the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, and it was recommended that I enroll in a New Testament course. Also during my conversation with my academic advisor, she examined my high school transcripts, and she was quite surprised. She said that because of my academic performance in high school, or lack thereof, I would be placed on academic probation and mentioned that if I did not achieve at least a 3.0 GPA in each of the first two semesters at BYU-Hawaii, I would lose my athletic scholarship. I had mentioned to my advisor, I said, wait a minute, I received a 35 on the ACT. She was surprised. I said, yes, I got 17 the first time, in 18 a second. <laughs> well, uh, I still think it's cumulative, right? <laughs> you know, in reality, I never had taken the ACT. <laughs> well, the rest of the story is this, that I did obtain the needed GPA, played NCAA Division I basketball, received a PhD from Arizona State University, finished my professional career as a CPA and as an associate professor of accounting at the University of Alabama. With love for and faith in Jesus Christ, determination, hard work, and a lot, a lot of help, much good can be achieved. Upon completing my PhD, I taught here at BYU and the Marriott School as an assistant accounting professor. My wife Stephanie and I did not attend BYU at any point of our academic studies, and so we really wanted to know about the lifestyle and challenges students faced on this campus. For the first six months of being a professor at BYU, we lived in the Wyview Park, married student housing. We moved in with our four young children 
in a very tight and cozy three-bedroom apartment, no more than about 800 square feet. Each morning, I walked to the Tanner Building, which provided an opportunity for me to visit with students and to learn of the challenges and uniqueness of the BYU campus community. Over the next eight years as a faculty member, I gained an appreciation for the goodness, determination, and courage of BYU students. You are faithful, devoted, intellectually capable, and spiritually discerning as you come into Christ in all aspects of your life. From these experiences and others, I have come to realize as we come unto Christ, He follows a pattern of instruction. He provides, He provides, oh my goodness. I think, okay, now I know where I am. I know you can get it. <laughs> there we go. Oh. Right? It only happens to me. <laughs> where Jesus Christ provides a pattern of instruction and inspiration for spiritual strength. He teaches eternal truths, extends invitations to act, and promises blessings to those who act in faith to fulfill this invitation. The Book of Mormon prophet Lehi demonstrates an example of this principle when he shared a vision of the Tree of Life with his family. Two of his sons, Laman and Lemuel, had questions regarding the symbolism associated with this vision. In 1 Nephi chapter 15, verse 23 to 24, they asked, Nephi, the younger brother, what meaneth the rod of iron which our father saw that led to the Tree of Life? Nephi under the guidance of the Holy Ghost, exemplifies Christ's patterns of instruction. He replied by teaching an eternal truth, extending an invitation with promised blessings. Nephi said, I said unto them that the rod of iron was the word of God, and whoso would hearken unto the word of God and would hold fast unto it, they would never perish, neither could the temptations and the fiery dart of the adversary overpower them unto blindness to lead them away to destruction. Christ, through his servant Nephi, extended the invitation to hearken and to hold fast to the Word of God. As we accept this invitation, the Lord has promised that we would never perish, and neither could the temptations and the fiery darts of Satan overpower us or lead us to destruction. An invitation to act with the promise that through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, death, and resurrection, we will find true happiness in him. I pray that the Holy Ghost would enlighten each of us as we understand the eternal truth regarding the atonement of Jesus Christ and to act in faith to fulfill His invitations so that we might receive His promised blessings and eternal truth. You remember the last few hours of Christ's life? It was the season of the Passover, a major Jewish holiday that celebrates the exodus of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. It was during this time that Jesus instituted the sacrament. The scripture records, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break and gave it to them and said, take it and eat. Behold, this is for you to do it in remembrance of my body. For as often as ye do this, you remember this hour that I was with you. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said unto them, This is in remembrance of my blood, which is shed for many, and the new covenant which I give unto you. For as of me ye shall bear record unto all the world, and as oft ye do, re ye do this ordinance, as oft as ye do this ordinance, ye remember me in this hour that I was with you, and drink with you of this cup, even the last time in my ministry. Jesus taught his beloved apostles of the significance of the sacrament and that through his holy ordinance we are connected to Christ and he is connected to us. Following the administration of the sacrament, he spoke these words to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan desires to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fails not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Jesus Christ is our advocate with the Father, and I believe he continually prays for you and for me that our faith in him will fail not. 
after the administration of the sacrament and his counsel to Peter, we read in the New Testament that Jesus walked with his apostles to the Mount of Olives in Gethsemane, to the place of the olive press. The book of Luke records, and he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto his apostles, pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was drawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed. Sisters and brothers, picture in your mind Jesus instructing his apostles to pray, to overcome temptation, and then withdrawing himself from them about a stone's cast. So about 30 or 40 yards, he walks away from them, and then he kneels down and prays, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. At this moment, Jesus knew he would take upon him the sins and the sorrows of the world. And he may have asked, Father, is there another way for me to pay this price for the human family? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, grape drops of blood falling down to the ground. The Savior felt the pains of all of our sins, all of our infirmities, heartaches, depression, anxieties, feelings of being marginalized, abused, forgotten, and mistreated. Every mortal experience that causes us to feel pain, anguish, and disappointment, Christ felt this in this very hour. And the pain was so great that it caused Jesus to bleed from every pore of his body. Well, you know the rest of the story. Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss. Jesus was arrested, beaten, and a crown of thorns was placed upon his head. He was judged and condemned to death. He was forced to carry the, a crossbeam to the place of execution known as Calvary. The execution squad nailed his hands and his feet. Jesus suffered more pain. Finally, Jesus gave up his life so that you and I may enjoy this life in greater abundance as we prepare for eternal life with God. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. On the first Easter morning, Sunday morning, Jesus Christ was resurrected. His body was reunited with his spirit into a perfect, glorified body. We invited his disciples and others to come forth unto him, that they may thrust their hands into his side and feel the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet, that they may know that he is the God of Israel and the God of the, of the whole earth, who has been slain for the sins, anguish, and pains of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned. The atonement of Jesus Christ is an eternal truth. Jesus' invitation is simple, and his promised blessings are assured as he declared, Come unto me, all ye that are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lonely in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Do we recognize his invitation? Do we recognize the, pro the power we can have from his promised blessings? Christ invites us to come unto him with the promise that he will give us rest. President Nelson describes exactly what this rest is. It is relief and peace. Christ invites us to take his yoke upon us and to learn of him, for he is meek and lonely in heart. Again, the promised blessing that we will find rest for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So how do we do it? How do we come unto Christ and receive his yoke and his rest? And may I offer three things that we can do to come unto him more fully. First, 
We come unto Jesus Christ by receiving his ordinances and making and keeping covenants with him. President Nelson shared, and I quote, each person who makes covenants in the baptismal fonts and in the temple and keeps them has increased access to the power of Jesus Christ. Please ponder that stunning truth. The reward of keeping covenants with God is heavenly power, power that strengthens us to withstand our trials, temptations, and heartaches better." Close quote. In January 2013, I was called to serve as the first African American state president in Alabama. Our family had moved to Alabama about 14 months earlier, and so we were relatively new to the stake which covered over 1,500 square miles and had 12 different congregations. Thus, I felt a need to visit each of the 12 congregations so they can get to know me and I can get to know them. In one of my first visits, I was invited to meet with a brother after the sacrament services. As we met, he reached his, into his pocket to hand me his temple recommend. This brother was serving as a temple ordinance worker. As he handed me his temple recommend, he explained that he could not sustain or support a person of color serving as his state president. He also shared that he had a problem with me being married to Stephanie, a person not of my race. This brother was sincere and honest with his problems and concern. He was self-aware enough to recognize how the disease of racism was affecting his ability to come unto Christ. He felt unworthy to worship in the house of the Lord, receive ordinances, and to make and keep his covenants with the Lord. I responded by giving this brother back his temple recommend and shared that if he had a problem with me because of my race and my marriage, then he needed to worship God in the house of the Lord more, not less. Temple worship can help us appreciate the beauties of God's creation in all its varieties. The temple can help us see beyond ourselves, our neighborhoods, and our nations. As we truly understand the ordinances and covenants of the temple, we come to recognize that the Lord loves diversity. As the Lord observed when he finished his work, and I, God, saw everything that I had made, and behold, all things which I had made were very very good. The Lord loves diversity. He loves me and he loves you. He wants us to know that we belong to his family. We are children, we are children of God. We are truly brothers and sisters. Elder D. Todd Christopherson shared, and I quote, a sense of belonging is important to our physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. We cannot permit racism of, of any form, tribal prejudice, or any divisions to exist in the Latter-day Church of Christ. The Lord commands us to be one. If we are not one, you are not mine. We should be diligent in rooting out prejudice and discrimination out of the church, out of our homes, and most of all, out of our hearts." Close quote. Later I share with the struggling brother that if he had a problem with me, it was a problem he needed to work out with the Lord. Please know, I have no problem in the way I look. I am comfortable in my own skin. Furthermore, I have no problem in the way Stephanie looks. She is beautiful beyond comparison. I then shared that I was more than willing to help this brother overcome his problem if he would let me. I sensed that he had a desire to change. He was humble. And he had a love for Christ just like me. In this instance, I asked if I can bring Stephanie with me to have dinner with him and his family in their home as his stake president. Two months later, I again visited the area and we had dinner in his home with his family. A friendship developed over the next five years. And when I was released as his stake president, we embraced each other with such a feeling of love and brotherhood as we both came to understand the spiritual power received from priesthood ordinances and in keeping covenants with the Father and His Son. President Nelson declared that yoking ourselves with the Savior through ordinances and covenants means we have access to His strength and redeeming power." Close quote. How do we come into Christ? 
we yoke ourselves to him as we receive his ordinances and keep our covenants with him. Second, we come unto Christ as we become engaged learners. President Nelson invited us to immerse ourselves in the scriptures to better understand Christ's mission and ministry. Know the doctrine of Christ so that we can understand his power for our lives. Eternalize the truth that the atonement of Jesus Christ applies to you and to me. The more we learn about the Savior, the easier it will be to trust in his mercy, his, his, in his infinite love, and it's his strengthening and healing and redeeming power." Close quote. We become engaged learners as we study the Holy Scriptures, especially the Book of Mormon, which is another testament of Jesus Christ. President Nelson shared his thought about the Book of Mormon when he said this, when I think of the Book of Mormon, I think of the word power. The truth of the Book of Mormon has the power to heal, comfort, restore, succor, strengthen, console, and cheer our souls. I promise that as you prayerfully study the Book of Mormon every day, you will make better decisions every day." Close quote. What an invitation, what a promise, as we seek to come unto Christ as engaged learners of the Holy Scriptures, including the Book of Mormon. Lastly, we come unto Christ as we minister to the One by using the ministering principles to love, to share, and to invite. The first and great commandment is to love God with all of our heart, might, mind, and strength. As we increase our desire to love God with all of our hearts by keeping His commandments, the Lord will deepen our ability to love our neighbors and to love ourselves. Our love for God should be the primary motivator in all that we do as we seek to minister to the One. With love, we share our time, experiences, resources, and our vulnerabilities as we nurture and help each other. Sharing vulnerabilities builds unity. None of us are immune from life challenges, trials and weaknesses, heartaches, and disappointments. As we minister with love and share thoughts, experiences, and resources to meet, those, to meet the needs of those we serve, we can invite them to come and see to come and help, and to come and belong. We can invite those that we love, we can invite those that we love to feel what we feel and to know what we know through the Holy Ghost. In July 2022, Stephanie and I returned home from Manchester, England after serving as mission leaders. We love the United Kingdom and its people and its culture. As mission leaders, we interviewed missionaries every six weeks, and during one of these interview sessions, I met with a wonderful sister missionary. Our relationships over the past few months had deteriorated to the point where there was a lack of trust between us. Unfortunately, the early part of our interview together intensified these feelings of mistrust. I was very direct with her, and she was very direct with me. We spent most of the interview defending our own points of views. The frustration of this interview was clearly reflected in my countenance and with my words. In the middle of our conversation, this good sister requested a priesthood blessing from me. The request came at a heated point of the interview. I thought to myself, you must be joking. You're asking me for a blessing now? This makes no sense. Unfortunately, I not only thought those words, but I expressed them out loud. The interview concluded, and I went to explain to Stephanie what had just transpired. Stephanie said, no, you didn't just do that, did you? <laughs> it was obvious that I had made a terrible mistake. I found an empty room at the church building and knelt to pray to my Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ. The words spoken to me through the Holy Ghost were clear. Peter, Peter, she is not yours, she is mine. Love her like I would love her. I responded, yea, Lord, you shared this with me once before. Please help me. Again, I received the reply. Peter, Peter, she is not yours, she is mine. 
love her like I will love her. I arose, found this good sister, and apologized for my lack of understanding and for my lack of showing love for her. We spoke again, and this time I spent more time listening to understand and to ascertain her needs. Once again, once we came to understand each other, I asked if she still wanted the blessing. I invited Stephanie into the room and gave a priesthood blessing. I do not recall the words spoken, but each of us felt an increased love for God and from God and for each other. Angels minister each of us, each to, to each of us in that room at that most sacred moment. So how do we come into Christ? We yoke ourselves to him by receiving ordinances and making and keeping covenants becoming engaged learners, and ministering to the one as he would minister to his children. My friends, let us see each other as the Savior sees us. Christ knows of our uncertainties, our doubts, and concerns. Please know we are children of a loving Heavenly Father who knows us by name. He knows of our personalities. He knows of our weaknesses and of our strengths. He knows of our divine potential and destiny. And he allows us to experience tough times because he also knows of our courage. He trusts us. He knows we will reach up and reach out to him through the redeeming and refining power of his son, Jesus Christ, and of his atonement. Christ knows there are people on this campus who feel alone, marginalized, mistreated, who feel their voices and their concerns are not being heard. Christ knows there are people on this campus who struggle knowing of their individual worth and goodness, and those who struggle with anxiety, depressions, and other forms of emotional challenges. Christ knows that there are people on this campus who struggle with various forms of addictions, drug and alcohol, and other forms of self-abuse or self-harm. Christ is also aware of the people on this campus with, with sincere desires to help but are not sure how for fear of offending or creating more harm. And yes, Christ knows there are people on this campus who are doing so wonderfully well in ministering and loving so many, and yet may feel overwhelmed and exhausted at times. To all, his invitation to act and his promised blessings are uniquely and lovingly intimate and catered specifically to you and carries the same powerful eternal truth. Come unto me, he says, all ye that are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Christ has declared, in the world you shall have tribulations. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. My friends, and truly, you are my friends. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is our Savior and Redeemer. He is our healer. He is our advocate with the Father. And to my friends, I leave with my love. You are beautiful and divine, and I hope you know that. You are a child of the living God. I also leave you with my witness that the words of the living Christ are true. Come unto him. Be of good cheer. He has overcome the world. And with him, so can you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our Father in heaven, we are extremely grateful, Father, for this day that we were able to gather together and hear of the beautiful music and the beautiful words that were spoken. Father, please bless that we will internalize the, this message, that we will come to know Christ and love him and become more like him as we make covenants with thee and with him as we study thy word in the scriptures, and as we come to love and minister to those around us and to understand them as Christ would. 
Father, we love thee so very much, and we are grateful for the love that thou hast shown us and for the strength that the atonement of Jesus Christ provides. Please help us to continue to cleave to that strength and to thee. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This has been a live broadcast of a BYU campus devotional. The address today was given by Elder Peter M. Johnson, a General Authority 70 of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Find links to the full text, audio, and video of this address within the week at speeches.byu.edu. Don't miss our next live forum address with climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe on Tuesday, November 29th at this same time. And tune in to BYU Radio tomorrow and every weekday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific for Finding Center, an hour of spiritual focus on what matters most. BYU Devotionals are a production of BYU Broadcasting.